Okay, uh, Dr. Pavlik, when you're ready, we may begin. Thank you very much, Aito. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone to our third archaeology webinar series of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and Traces Asia. And thank you for joining us again today. This webinar is jointly hosted and facilitated by Aido Balboa, Mylene Leasing, Dr. Rick Fuentes, and myself. The webinar series is supported by the School of Social Sciences, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, and the RIT and its Eduardo J. Aboitis Sandbox Zone. Let me now introduce our speaker, who is actually someone who needs no introduction at all. Professor Don Johansson is one of the most accomplished and prominent scholars of human origins. And most of us have probably encountered him already in the many TV documentaries and features on human origins and listened in excitement when he shared and explained his scientific discoveries. I think some of us even came to this discipline because of Don Johansson. There's even an asteroid named after him, and another asteroid and a spacecraft are named after his discovery, the most famous and thoroughly studied fossil of the 20th century, Lucy. And Lucy is also at the center of the lecture he will present in our webinar today. Don Johansson's discovery in Ethiopia in 1974 of a fossil with an intriguing mix of human and ape-like features added a crucial link that fundamentally changed our understanding of human evolution. Professor Don Johansson holds the Virginia M. Allman Chair in Human Origins at Arizona State University and is the founding director of the Institute of Human Origins. He is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, a distinguished member of the Siena Academy of Sciences in Italy, and an honorary board member of the Explorers Club and recipient of their highest honor, the Explorers Club Medal in 2010. He's also the recipient of the American Book Award in Science for the book, Lucy, The Beginnings of Humankind. His website, becominghuman.org, won the Webby Award in 2002 for best science website. It is really a great pleasure and wonderful to welcome Don Johansson in our webinar today. And I hand over the microphone to Mylene now, who met Don Johansson before the pandemic and invited him to the Philippines. Well, the COVID-19 outbreak has unfortunately crossed that plan, but only for now. And we all look forward to meeting Don Johansson in person as soon as possible. Thank My you, name. Alfred. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Don. And we'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Harry Widianto, who is with us. So uh, Don Johansson is just as iconic as the fossil that he and his team discovered in 1974, Lucy. So when I knew that there was a chance that I would be meeting him at the Homo Erectus 100 plus 25th anniversary conference in Tbilisi in 2016, I took with me my copy of his book, Lucy's Legacy, so that I could ambush him for an autograph. When I approached him during the opening event, I introduced myself as, hello, I'm Mylene from the Philippines. And the first thing that Don said was, well, when am I going to the Philippines? <laughs> and I guess that got the ball rolling. And it also turns out that Don has a very good friend who lives here. Planning on how to bring Don over started. And the, although we kept missing seeing each other in person again in Frankfurt for his Von Kinigswald lecture at the Senckenberg because I had just left and in San Francisco because he was in Africa, we were eventually able to come up with something concrete when the Philippine chapter of YPO, Young President's Organization, a global business um, organization through then President Raymond Rufino expressed interest in working with us on this. Don was supposed to, to finally come to the Philippines in April 2020, but some virus had other plans for everyone. 
And so today, we are extremely happy and fortunate, even if it's just online for now, with emphasis on for now, because we look forward to having Don here with us sometime in the near future, to have with us and to speak for the very first time to a Philippine audience, and of course, we welcome our other friends who are joining us from elsewhere in the world, a man who continues to be a benchmark for all paleoanthropologists as he has made some of the most profound contributions to the study of human evolution, and also someone who is such a generous spirit and a charismatic speaker. I assure you, you will enjoy his talk even if you're not a specialist in the fields of anthropology or paleoanthropology. And with that, I turn you over to Dr. Rick Sarfuentes, who will now give us a brief on what to expect from this wonderful lecture of Dr. Donald Johansson. Thanks, Maylene. So um, although Australopithecus afarensis was named in 1978, this species continues to play a vital role in our understanding of the early hominin fossil record in Africa. Subsequent discoveries in both South Africa and Eastern Africa test earlier hypotheses of the phylogenetic placement of this species on the human family tree. Continuing work stimulated by fossil finds in the Afar Triangle of Ethiopia have broadened our view of species diversity, ecological settings, and the behavioral adaptations of Pliocene hominins. For this morning's talk, entitled The Role of Australopithecus Afarensis in Paleoanthropology, we welcome Professor Don Johansson. Professor, the floor is now yours. Well, thank you so much. I am I'm thrilled to have this opportunity. I love to talk about uh, Australopithecus afarensis, that tongue twister. Uh, and I thought uh, this evening I would focus on and pick up on one of your words, the role of Australopithecus afarensis in paleoanthropology. And uh, I also particularly want to thank Mylene for uh, being so active in paleoanthropology and over, over the world. I mean, in Europe and the United States and how about Africa? Have you been in Africa? No, we, we have to take her to Africa, that's for sure. have to do something about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm your guy. We'll figure that out. Wonderful. But, uh, it's, it's what is so interesting about the study of paleoanthropology, and I always joke and say it's not the study of old anthropologists, but the study of uh, ourselves, the study of humans. Uh, how did we get here? Uh, when and where did that journey begin? And why is it so incredibly important for us to know something about our ancestry? Uh, how in the world uh, I'm frequently asked, how in the world did a young kid, you know, the son of Swedish immigrants growing up in the eastern part of the United States in the state of Connecticut, how in the world did I get involved in, in what is relatively um, a somewhat extraordinary investigation, and that is the investigation of, of how we became human. And the human career beginning, we think somewhere between six and eight million years ago is, is, is highly distinguished by uh, a species today, which we all call Homo sapiens, that has that unique ability and that great depth of enthusiasm and interest in trying to understand in, within the scientific world how we evolved and became ourselves today. I think probably it's one of those questions that our children ask us, one of the first questions, you know, mommy, daddy, where did I come from? And in this case, this is an investigation of trying to understand the origins of, of humankind. And what I find so unique about it is that we are the only creature we know of in the universe. That's a big place. Last night, I was looking through a friend's telescope at marvelous nebulae and so on at a little gathering we had at my home. And uh, yet, you know, here we are on this little, as Carl Sagan said, this little blue dot in the universe. What has made us so special? And how did this story unroll and, and, and lead to uh, a species such as our own? and a species that has that curiosity to investigate its past. And uh, 
One of the questions that I, I thought I would uh, address right off the bat is how in the world did I get interested as a young boy? Uh, what was that catalyst? And that catalyst was a anthropology professor who, was, uh, who had immigrated from Germany in 1936. And he was a social cultural anthropologist, worked in Africa and brought home wonderful stories about his work in Africa. And I met him when I was around nine years old. And he introduced me to anthropology. I didn't know what that word meant at nine years old. And uh, he gave me one of the great gifts. He gave me access to his library. And his library was literally from the floor to the ceiling in his apartment, in every room, and piles of books you had to snake your way through. So he was the consummate German scholar. And uh, I wasn't particularly interested in social cultural anthropology. Uh, I was more interested in the biological aspects of how we became human. And uh, one afternoon when I was 13 years old, uh, I pulled a slim book off of his bookshelf called uh, Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature. And it was written by Thomas Henry Huxley and published way back in 1863. And what was so important about this book was it was a series of presentations. Huxley was of course, one of the great friends of Charles Darwin who had shaken the world with his ideas of uh, of the theory of evolution. Uh, he was applying this really to ourselves. And the, the great mystery that was unveiled for me in that book was that he predicted, as did Charles Darwin, that because we most closely resemble the African apes, not so much the orangs and gibbons and things in Asia, but the African apes, that Africa would be the place to go to find fossils. And secondly, that we must have shared a common ancestor with those African apes, as I said, somewhere between six and 8 billion years ago. And to a 13 year old, this opened my mind to an entirely new landscape. Uh, and I wanted to be part of those discoveries. And very soon after that, there were discoveries announced from Africa's Great Rift Valley by the Leakey family, particularly Old of Gorge. And I knew there were ongoing expeditions and I wanted to travel to Africa to have an opportunity to search for these missing links as they sometimes are called. Not quite sure why it's doing this, but there we go. So I knew Africa was the place to go. I wasn't going to find early human ancestors in the new world in the United States, the Western hemisphere. And uh, Africa was fascinating to me as a child because of its incredible diversity. Its diversity of landscapes, its diversity of cultures, its diversity of languages. And uh, as we now know, its diversity of apes back in the Miocene more than sort of 10 million years ago, there were probably tens of different species of uh, apes running around Africa. And this was the crucible in which natural selection that Darwin had articulated so poignantly, began working on the variations in apes and so on, in climates and environments and so on, that ultimately sculpted some of the earliest humans. Uh, the problem was, was how do you get to Africa? Uh, I was an undergraduate, I was studying archeology span and uh, that question really loomed over my head. And I decided that there was really only one way to get there. And that was to find somebody who was working and looking for fossils there and to approach them to see if I could become their student and then travel to Africa. And that happened late 1960s when I attended the University of Chicago and first went to what is today Ethiopia, the Southern part of Ethiopia that we'll return to shortly. And during the course of my summers, in uh, Southern Ethiopia, I began to meet a great variety of extraordinarily bright, dedicated, passionate geologists, paleontologists, anthropologists, and so on, who were captivated as I was by this quest to understand our origins. This keeps going, it, it goes the wrong way, I don't know why. All right, but first I wanna really pay homage to a, a dear colleague who passed last year, this is uh, Maurice Taieb, uh, was a, uh, he was a Frenchman. 
He was, uh, he lived in Marseille and he in the late eighties was undertaking geological survey in a rather unknown part of Ethiopia, which is known as the Afar Triangle. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. And during the course of his studying and mapping these rock layers and so on, he saw that there were a vast fields of, of fossilized animals. Some of them you couldn't miss, like elephants that you fall over if you missed them because they're so big. But a great variety of antelopes and uh, gazelles and monkeys uh, and so on. Uh, and he didn't know really what they were or how old they were. And I met him in Paris and we looked at photographs. And out of his incredible generosity, he invited me to go and explore this region with him uh, in 1972. So uh, I salute Maurice, who was uh, the leader in bringing this, these vast opportunities for finding fossils of our human ancestry and shared them so unselfishly with anyone and everyone who wanted to go. So this was our motley group in 1973. Uh, Maurice is uh, fifth from the right there. Uh, I'm somewhere in there, I don't know where I am. Oh, I guess, yes, I'm the fourth from the left, much thinner in those days. And we had set up a little camp. We had about three small tents and a couple of sleeping tents. And uh, it was our first field season. Uh, we had gotten a very small grant from the National Science Foundation and from the French uh, Center for National uh, Scientific Research. And uh, our hope was to find some human fossils, some hominid fossils. Uh, we didn't have any problems finding pigs and elephants and rhinos and so on. And during that field season, uh, uh, we were, here's the Afar Triangle, which you can see is quite enormous. This is the Horn of Africa just here. Uh, Addis Ababa is the capital. You see the rough outline of Ethiopia itself. There are places in the Afar, which are below sea level, for example. It's a desert today, essentially. And uh, it's the continuation of the Great Rift Valley that we see here. And sites down around Lake Turkana, which was then known as Lake Rudolph, and in Southern Ethiopia, were yielding fossils of our human ancestors. And uh, the, so the Great Rift Valley has played a very important geological role in uh, opening up the crust of this part of Africa and allowing us to look back uh, into far distant times. And the site that we were working in 1973 is just here where the river turns. There's a river here called the Awash. It never makes it to the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden, uh, Addis Ababa, and here is the Omo. So we knew that the Great Rift Valley was important, but people hadn't really looked much further north than uh, Southern Ethiopia. So Maurice really drew attention to a mag a astonishingly beautiful area pictured here. Uh, and during phase one of our research there, uh, we, our, our flag was the International Afar Research Expedition. And it was, it was mostly a uh, French-American collaboration. Um, and we would spend up to two to three months a year uh, looking for fossils here in our, uh, basing ourselves uh, along the river. Uh, and in the distance, you see uh, the green of the river, which means there was a permanent source of water for us there, so we could actually support a large team. These are to a paleontologist or geologist. Uh, these are beautifully stratified ancient rock layers that go back to about 3.4 million years now, uh, as far as uh, we didn't know that at the time. And there are white layers in here, which are volcanic ashes that we could use for dating uh, these layers. And we had all these fossils, but we didn't have any fossil humans. Uh, but I was absolutely certain that we would eventually find something. And the first human fossil ever found in that huge off our triangle, I found in October of 1973. Here's the distal end of the uh, femur or thigh bone and the proximal end of the tibia. And it was one afternoon I was out surveying and uh, found these two bones 
And the, what was so striking about them was how beautiful the preservation is, but also the fact that you see, just like the human knee joint over here, it rises at a steep angle to the horizontal. Whereas in quadrupedal animals like monkeys and apes, it rises uh, perpendicular to the horizontal. So we knew this was from a human ancestor. We knew that it walked upright. We knew that it was well over 3 million years old. And we knew we had now finally opened up a new window into the past. The 3 million year barrier had stopped us for many years. There are beyond 3 million years in 1973, virtually every fossil that was a, a human ancestor you could fit into your hand. So this is what spurred us on. Uh, that was the single discovery of that year that allowed us to begin to expand our expeditions. And of course, the way we find these fossils, as you probably all know, is by survey and walking and looking and walking and looking and hoping that we will spot something on the ground. And the very next year, which was a, a, a challenging year for us, because 1974 is when a military uh, uprising took over the country and ousted the emperor Haile Selassie. And that happened just days after I, before I arrived in Addis Ababa in September of 1974. And everyone I spoke to said the country is undergoing a revolution. It is completely unstable. It is dangerous. You cannot go out into the middle of those deserts for three months. And I said, well, I'm going. And, the, and during that expedition, uh, the fossil I found was this little piece of elbow. That's the olecranon process right there, your elbow that sticks out. And I knew from my knowledge of comparative osteology that this could not be a monkey, that it couldn't be an antelope, that it had to be a human. But what was so strange about it is it was tiny. Look how small it is compared to my thumb there as I'm holding it. And uh, as we kneeled down, I was with my graduate student here on the left, Tom Gray. You can tell he's the graduate student and I'm the professor because he's doing all the work down there. Um, but what we're doing are picking up the fragments that were eroding out of this hillside. And these little orange and blue markers mark the very fragments that we had collected that morning. And uh, we saw pieces of a skull. Unfortunately, the skull was very incomplete, only tops of the parts of the sides and a little bit of the back. Uh, but we uh, ended up collecting a whole series of bones that, as you know, led to this wonderful skeleton uh, that is popularly known as uh, Lucy and has become as iconic, I think, in paleoanthropology as any fossil could ever be. Uh, we have about, you know, about 60% or so, 40% of a, of, a, of a single skeleton. We have arms associated with legs. Uh, we have a pelvis, which is crucial and very, very rare. Uh, this creature, this female who lived 3.2 million years ago, probably had come down to the paleo lake that was there. And maybe she was coming down to drink. Maybe she was coming down to collect crocodile or turtle eggs or crabs. They were all fossilized in the same layer that she was. Uh, and how she died, we don't know. We think that a crocodile probably caught her unawares. There's one little puncture mark on the front of her pelvis here. But this, to find a specimen this complete of that antiquity at that time was incredibly unique. Uh, AL is just the, the field number we gave her. We were celebrating in camp, as probably all of you know. We were celebrating the discovery and being a great Beatles fan. I was listening to Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and uh, Lucy in the Sky with, with Diamonds was playing and someone on the expedition said, Don, if you think this is really female, and I did because of the very short stature, imagine her fully grown thigh bone or femur is only about 280 millimeters or about a, 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 a ruler, a, a foot long. So this was a short creature, about a meter, three and a half feet tall or so. And it was an adult. And I thought because of that small size and the very 
delicate bones of her skull and her lower jaw that it was a female. And someone said, why don't we call her Lucy? And that's how she got her name. It was impossible to change that. The next morning, we went back to the Lucy site to find more of Lucy's skeleton, to try to find out how old Lucy was when she died and so on. So she became uh, the, the real spokesperson, the, the icon, the, the magnet, the benchmark by which all other discoveries uh, have been judged over the last almost 50 years. It's incredible to think that 50 years, 1974 in, in 2024 will be the 50th year uh, after her discovery and uh, having the great fortune of having found her when I was a young man, I'm still alive to be able to talk about her and to present to you a little bit about my hypothesis of why she was important and how that hypothesis was tested. Uh, you know, we think of hypotheses and theories as something that are tested in laboratories. And the only way to test those hypotheses that she was a new species, that she occupied a very important place on the human family tree, was to find additional fossils, both, both older, younger, and uh, other specimens of her own species. Uh, definitively, uh, she was upright. She was bipedal, which is a cardinal feature. Charles Darwin suggested when our distant ancestors came to the ground, uh, they adopted upright walking, which freed their upper limbs from locomotion. But you can see how long her upper limb is, her arm comes down almost to mid thigh or a little bit below that. And this is probably a leftover from the time that her ancestors were living in the trees in more arboreal habitats. You notice she had a very projecting face, which is very ape-like and a relatively small brain. So this was in many, a, many ways, an ape that stood up. Uh, in this early reconstruction, uh, her vertebral column, her spine is very vertical, but thanks to people like Carol Ward and others who have, who have studied the skeleton, uh, we now know that she had the same S curvature that we did. And the pelvis is obviously the pelvis of a creature that walked upright and not of a quadruped. So this was very important. It showed us that bipedalism clearly predated brain expansion. Uh, Darwin thought that all happened at the same time. And uh, she presented us with uh, an interesting specimen where we could compare upper and lower limb proportions uh, and so on. And this led, it stimulated the late uh, Mary Leakey, uh, who was uh, married to Louis Leakey, of course, and uh, part of that sort of dynasty in Eastern Africa. Unfortunately, this past, uh, this recently, my, my colleague and friend Richard Leakey, their son, passed away. Uh, and he was working at Lake Turkana when I was working up in the Afar in the 70s. And we didn't always agree on things, but we loved to share our fossils and dazzle each other with our latest discoveries. And uh, I invited him and uh, his mother and uh, his wife, Meev Leakey, who is continuing to work in Kenya, uh, now his widow, unfortunately, uh, to come up and see the site. I wanted to show off my playground of fossil hominids. And they came up, they flew up in Richard's plane from Kenya. And Mary Leakey was so stimulated by that opportunity to see fossils that were now more than 3 million years old. She said, you know, Lewis and I visited a site in Tanzania uh, in, I think, 1939. And there were fossils, but we didn't find any human fossils. And we didn't go back because there weren't any stone tools. Maybe we ought to go back there. And they went back to Lytoli, Mary and a small team, and they found teeth and jaws that looked just like the ones from Afar, that were the same species, Australopithecus afarensis. And they found one of the great treasures of the natural world, the ancient world, I should say. They found a trail of human footprints that were impressed in a volcanic ash that came out of a volcano 3.7 million years ago. And I'm sure every one of you watching has walked on the beach sometime in your bare feet, and that looks just like the footprint you left. There's your big toe right there, 
that we use to push off. Here are the lateral toes. Here is the transverse and longitudinal arch to our feet, which acts like kind of a, a spring and the deep uh, heel strike. So this is as modern a foot as we could find. And because of Lucy's discovery, Mary was encouraged to go back and look at these sites and, and really outdid us with this discovery of these uh, footprints. And then she began, her team began finding teeth and jaws. And here you see one of the mandibles from Hadar, one of our more complete ones, and a mandible from Lytoli uh, in Tanzania. So this was found in Tanzania, this was found in Ethiopia. And they're virtually out of the same mold. So when you have fossils that are that similar, you know that they belong to the same species. So here we were looking at footprints left by Lucy's relatives who lived in Tanzania um, 400,000 years, 500,000 years before Lucy lived in Ethiopia, which gave us a glimpse into the fact that this was a very long surviving species. Um, and then in 1975, this is a picture of my old lab in Cleveland when I was at the Natural History Museum. You see Lucy down here, you see the Lytoli fossils, you see some other prominent fossils from Hadar. And this collection right here, which is from a site known as AL333, which is a collection of somewhere between 14 and 17 individuals that were killed or died at the same time and buried in the same geological level. And we have adult males, adult females, we have children, um, we have uh, infants. So here was an opportunity to look into what is so important when we name a species like Offerensis. What is the range of variation? Are there really two species in here or three species or does this constitute one single species? And that was our major job to evaluate uh, the importance of these in terms of the taxonomy. Were they a new species? And here in the summer of 1978, uh, I published in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History along with my colleagues, Tim White and Eve Copans from Paris, uh, a new species of Australopithecus. And uh, we, we determined that they were significantly different in their anatomy from all other Australopithecus, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus robustus, Australopithecus boisei, or if you want to call it Paranthropus boisei, uh, and other species of Australopithecus. And uh, we made this bold move to name this new species, and this ultimately demanded that we redraw the human family tree. So four years after the discovery of this fossil, not only did we announce a new species, but earlier that year at a Nobel symposium in Sweden, uh, I presented uh, my hypothesis, which was a drawing of, of a change in the, in the geometry of the human family tree. So Afarensis, uh, we've got males and females. And sure enough, here's Lucy's forearm bone, her ulna. And this is an ulna of a male of her species. Here's Lucy's mandible reconstructed and a male mandible. And here is a thigh bone of a male afarensis and a female afarensis. So you see they're just different sizes of the same anatomy. This raised, I don't know how many papers were published criticizing this saying, well, these are really two species and so on. Uh, but now finally, after all these years, uh, they're pretty much accepted. It is pretty much accepted that this is a single highly dimorphic uh, species of Australopithecus that lived between about 3.9 and 3 million years ago. Uh, and you see males were about five feet in stature, females about three and a half. And, uh, males and females, in some cases, very highly dimorphic, almost on the level that we see in uh, orangutans of today, which is very, very unusual. So sexual dimorphism um, is, is, uh, is very characteristic of the genus Australopithecus. You find that with Africanus and Robustus and Boisei and so on. 
And here you see it. Uh, and this is a much more ape-like pattern rather than a human-like pattern. Uh, we now know that uh, Afarensis was probably the most widespread species of Australopithecus uh, in Africa. Uh, we find it in Tanzania, we find it in uh, Kenya, we find it in Ethiopia, which constitutes probably about 90% of the whole hippodyme for the species. Uh, and there is a mandible from Chad, which I am uh, pretty much convinced belongs to the same species. What this means, or what it meant to us, was that they were geographically widespread, they were in very diverse sets of environments, which meant that this was a species that was highly adaptable. You know, a species that subsist and, and continue, whether they're pigs or elephants or rhinos or monkeys, or in this case, humans, are the ones that can adapt to changes in the environment. Because when the environment changes, you can either adapt and change, or you can go extinct, or you can try to follow that environment as it disappears to another place. But in this case, I think we're looking at a very geographically wide species, uh, one that was highly adaptable. And when one looks at the general anatomy of the skull in particular, uh, a very generalized ape-like pattern with no particular strong specializations like what you would see in things like Boise eye, for example. Um, we thought uh, that they lived largely in much more wooded environments. Uh, we know that there's some evidence for, well, there's good evidence for riverine forests along the, what, the paleo rivers that fed into that ancient Lake Hadar three million years ago. Uh, and certainly they were vegetarians, uh, as we can tell from the wear in their teeth and from various uh, uh, trace element studies. Uh, I suspect they lived in groups, uh, not unlike what we see in chimpanzees, mixed male and female groups, um, and um, ate a variety of foods, uh, as I indicated. Cable, uh, stable carbon isotopic data uh, that uh, comes from studies of the uh, afarensis specimens, the teeth in essence, suggest uh, that uh, they were uh, living in somewhat more open areas. I wouldn't, I, I don't know why I wrote savannas here. I don't think they were really in savannas at this point. I think they were in more open grasslands, kind of bushland, and they were eating lots of grasses and sedges and succulents, a lot of fruits, uh, unlike apes, which are, are C3. Uh, creatures that eat parts of trees and shrubs and herbs and live in very close woodlands. But they also, I suspect, as I said, we found crocodile eggs, we found turtle eggs. You know, turtle eggs are round and crocodile eggs look more like the ones in your fridge. Uh, small rodents, uh, I would imagine, I did a television series a number of years ago and suggested Lucy like the chimpanzees that Jane Goodall observed at, at Gombe Stream Reserve in Tanzania were termiting and eating insects. And of course I had to try termites and I've actually found out I, I like them fried better than raw. But they're high in protein and amino acids. There are nuts in the forest, there are seeds, underground storage uh, organs. And the question is, was there much meat in their diet? I, I don't think there was in um, afarensis. Um, it, you know, we know that chimps occasionally hunt collectively, uh, but you know, they have, they have the apparatus to eat meat, big slashing canines, right? Powerful arms to rip these bodies apart and so on. Uh, these little hominins like Lucy and her type um, didn't have any of that. They didn't really have stone tools. I'll return to that. That's a big controversy. I was just finishing a paper uh, today on brain expansion and uh, tool manufacture and so on. Uh, but I, I think they were essentially vegetarians. And of course, we know that the climate began to change around 3 million years and Afarensis disappears at that point. And on the other side of 3 million years, we find a diversity of species, which I will return to. Um, so in 1981, uh, there was a moratorium placed on research uh, in, in Ethiopia. 
the Ministry of Culture felt it was uh, too insecure in the countryside for us to uh, undertake our research. And uh, I spent some time at Olduvai, but that's a, another presentation, I guess. And, uh, and finally, in 1990, the uh, Ethiopian government, uh, it was still under the presence of a military government, but uh, they uh, offered uh, invitations for various teams, including the Institute of Human Origins, uh, where I now work, uh, to go back to undertake field work. Uh, Tim White was working with his team in the Middle Awash. There were some French working down in the Omo, and we were thrilled to be able to go back. And the reason we were thrilled to go back was that there were a lot of things missing. You know, we had, you know, we hear this hackneyed expression always, you know, the answers open up more questions. Well, they did, uh, because we didn't really know how old Lucy was until the early 1990s. We knew she was over 3 million, but we didn't know how old. Was she 3.3 or 3.4? Was she, you know, we did, just didn't know. We didn't have the technology. We didn't have skulls of her species, right? And skulls, these, these things, I don't know if you can see that, but these skulls are the ones that hold so much of the anatomy that's important for us uh, to define and recognize, uh, well, it's not working very well, is it? Well, there we are. Very shy tonight, I guess. Um, but uh, we, we diagnose new species largely on, on what the skull looks like. And we didn't have them. And this was a huge criticism. You know, how come you guys haven't found any skulls? Well, because they're not easy to find, that's why. And uh, so we went back uh, in phase two, which was called the Hadar Research Project. And this is the area we work. And we have this wonderful river, which is a source of water. And I'm sure you've all spotted my field camp there. That little dot is out in the middle of nowhere. So you better remember to bring your toothbrush because you can't go to a, to a pharmacy nearby to buy these things. You have to bring everything with you. And it's a pretty desolate place. But uh, for me, it is such a joy to be in the field, to be uh, living in a little community like this that we create. We arrive with a, with a big lorry with all of the tent material and kitchen material and set up showers as you can see here and there's a research tent over here and this is an eating tent here our kitchens over here wake up in the, those glorious african mornings and sit on the edge of uh, this cliff just here and gaze across the awash river and watch the monkeys waking up and the sun coming up and knowing that you are going to be doing all day what you want to do more than anything else you know how many I, I, I think when I'm out there, how many people can live their childhood dream? I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to find something. And there I was sitting on the banks of that river, having my morning coffee, knowing we don't know what's going to happen today, what's going to be found. And the incredible number of people who, you know, essentially volunteered and begged to participate in these expeditions grew and grew and grew, as did our funding, fortunately. And our teams were fairly large. We began working very closely with um, Ethiopian scholars. Uh, this, this young man's a geologist. He did his PhD in the United States with Jim Aronson at Western Reserve University. There are other PhDs in here and other Ethiopian scholars, Mike Tesfai, uh, a geologist, uh, Tamra Bodajo, and others um, who folded so nicely into the research because, you know, it isn't just us who are interested in this. They're fascinated. And the local people who live there, as you see, they all have Kalashnikovs um, to help protect us and protect us from wild animals and also from a a rival tribe across the river that likes to wake us up in the morning sometimes with a, a little machine gun blast over the camp to let us know they're still there. And um, these people became just absolutely fascinated with the idea that 
we were finding things that were, they didn't, you know, say three and a half million years, it, that's hard to conceive of, you know? I mean, we were looking at, 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 at nebulae or galaxies last night that were, you know, 5,000 light years away. I mean, how, how do you even conceive of that? And, you know, they're, they're Muslim, right? They read out of the Quran every day. They pray, you know, numerous times a day. There's not a lot of room in their world for evolution, right? But they incorporated these discoveries in the most fascinating way. I was walking back to my little tent one night after my uh, shower and uh, they were praying and they were talking about Allah and they were talking about Johansson and they were talking about Lucy. And you know, I said to one of my interpreters, what are they talking about? He said, they are thanking Allah for bringing you, Johansson, here to find Lucy, who was the first human, which means that all humans are descended from our, our tribe. And that's how they incorporated that into their world. And that taught me a very important lesson. Uh, Kay Reed did her PhD, not with us. She was a postdoc. She's now a very uh, prominent professor at ASU. And these were, these are the days that are just, etched into my, my, my mind and my heart. Um, so let's take a look at something that makes geologists very happy, geological column, the Hadar formation as it's called. So it's like a layer cake and you can see it in the background here. Uh, and things at the bottom are older. This, this particular ash at the bottom is 3.42 million years, 3,420,000 years plus or minus something like 30,000 years. There's a lava or basalt. It's a little bit younger. Here's a, another volcanic ash at 3.24 million years, just where the first family was found. And then there's the Lucy specimen just here. Uh, AL-288, which is just above this 3.2 million year old uh, volcanic ash. And then there is a disconformity. There was either no deposition or enormous erosion here. So there's this big segment of time missing, uh, which is unfortunate for us, um, particularly because I can't move. The, yeah, I can't move this. Uh, up here at the top, uh, we have a, a tuft that's about 2.4 million, okay? But there's a lot of missing time in here. You have 3 million, and then you've lost, uh, you know, hundred, half a million years of time. Um, and in those layers, we began to find the very early specimens of our own genus, which I'll, I'll return to, and stone tools. So Australopithecus afarensis, with uh, you know close to 400 specimens from, from Hadar itself, uh, over 400,000 years, almost a half a million years, gives us a incredibly important uh, reference collection for anyone studying early hominid evolution in Africa. Uh, so the geology was good to us. Uh, the paleo depositional environment was good to us. Um, and the exposures today of erosion have been very good to us. So I wanna to mention two uh, very important colleagues. Uh, Yoel Rack is an Israeli anatomist, just retired from Tel Aviv University, uh, who was a specialist of skulls. That was his, his thesis at Berkeley. It was called The Skull of Australopithecus. And it was published in a book. And this is uh, Bill Kimball, who's just stepped down as director of the Institute of Human Origins, who was a student of mine way back in 1974 in Cleveland. And uh, both of them became sort of the world experts on cranial anatomy. And they were dying for skulls. And uh, fortunately, uh, after the 1990, we found a male skull, kind of an ugly looking guy, and a female skull, uh, which you would expect would be different in size. And uh, the three of us, uh, under the direction of Bill, uh, Kimball, Rack, and Johansson, published a, one of those boring, thick volumes on cranial anatomy. And uh, they, they have played such an important role in the uh, second phase of the uh, Hadar research. 
so if we take a look at uh, the skulls, you see on the left, uh, a fairly complete specimen missing some incisors up here, but we have so many other specimens that we can put the right kinds of incisors in there and make a complete reconstruction of a 3,100,000 year old female and a male, which is about 3 million years old. So these are, you know, sounds like a lot, right? They lived within 100,000 years of one another, but um, they, they give us in, incredible insight into the anatomy, the cranial anatomy of uh, this species. We have a female and a male. The first, this male was found by Yol Rack, which was it, like it was his destiny. You know, he broke the skull of Australopithecus and here he found the first pieces of this. And I can't, I remember driving into camp and he's standing there and he's holding this thing up for me to see. And of course, I, barely see what it, whether it's a piece of toast or a piece of skull. And I come closer and I say, he says, it's a skull. And it was a back part of a skull. And after numerous hours of excavation and suffering under that African sun, we got most of this uh, male specimen. And then in 2002, the day after I left the expedition to come back to the Institute, of course, they found this nearly complete female skull. Um, and most recently, people say, well, what, why, do so, why is it so important to keep these fossils in a museum and preserve them? And I said, because new techniques, new insights, new ways of studying come along. And we need to be able to get back to those specimens and look at them through new lenses. And um, for example, uh, in a recent article, Australopithecus afarensis endocast suggests ape-like brain organization and prolonged brain growth. That's important, that's interesting to note that we looked at the endocasts in, in the CT scans and we could see that there were sutures or sul the sulcuses, these little valleys in our cortex, in our neocortex that are positioned as they would be in an ape. But there was some 20% increase in brain size over an average chimpanzee. It means that brains grew before they changed their anatomy. And also by looking, Gary Schwartz, who is uh, also a member of the Institute of Human Origins, uh, looked at the ages of when these individuals died and looked at the sizes, the growth rates, and was able to show that there was prolonged brain growth after birth. There was rapid brain growth um, before birth in these creatures, but it slowed down after birth, which gave it a somewhat extended childhood. We would never have been able to put this together in 1974 because we needed special scanners. We needed uh, special imaging. We needed uh, more knowledge about the dental development and so on of, of apes and humans. So um, this has been a great addition. This article that just appeared a couple of years ago, fascinating, uh, an incredibly important article in my estimation. Now, what was this hypothesis? You know, the, the, our hypotheses are phylogenies, right? They're family trees. So this is a very simplified version, all right? We had Australopithecus afarensis here between three and sort of 3.8 or 3.9 million. We had early Homo, which most people would call Homo habilis. And we had Paranthropus or Australopithecus boisei, which is like uh, Nutcracker Man from Old Dubai. The, these robust creatures that have big crest on the top of their head, very powerful jaws, huge crushing and grinding molars. And my hypothesis in 78 was that this generalized widespread geographically species Alcarensis was the last common ancestor to these two lineages. But what was the problem with that? The problem with that was 1.2 million years of no fossils. So that was one of the criticisms that was made. You know, how can Don Johansson be so brash as to uh, say this? Well, I poised it as a hypothesis. And as I said, since I was uh, young at that time and have been able to follow it, 
um, we began to see how these new discoveries fit in. This is a, a, a cranium of uh, the black skull, which is uh, known as uh, Australopithecus Ethiopicus. That's about 2.5 million that was found by uh, Richard Leakey's team at Lake Tracana with a huge sagittal crest where these chewing muscles, the temporalis muscles, and massive cheekbones were the masseter muscles for chewing. And um, how did that fit into my model? Well, if you look at Australopithecus boisei, it doesn't look anything like Lucy's species. It's got a very flat face, for example, enormous teeth. Whereas Ethiopicus, which is halfway between, really, uh, uh, Ethiopicus is halfway between Boisei and Afarensis, what we see is that Ethiopicus has a projecting face, uh, a projecting face just like in Afarensis, but it has the big molars and sagittal crest of its descendant. So this is an intermediate species between Afarensis and Boisei that supports the idea that it's highly likely that Afarensis gave rise to this more dedicated vegetarian that ultimately reduced its face and changed the whole biomechanics of chewing uh, at 1.8 billion years, uh, is uh, we call it Boisei. Again, uh, looking at 1985, we didn't have anything on the other lineage, right? There were people, particularly uh, Richard Leakey, who felt that Homo had its own separate, very ancient ancestry, and that it didn't hook up with Afarensis. That was one of our, our points of contention and argument. So what we needed was to try to find something in this two to three million year time range that might fall on the HOMO line. So in 1994, during the second phase of the Hadar uh, research, uh, this upper jaw, this maxilla, uh, was found in sediments that are 2.4 million, uh, because there are good volcanic dates there. This is what your or my upper jaw looks like, sort of parabolic. This is what an ape jaw looks like, looks like a box, right? It's long. Uh, from front to back, narrow from side to side, and parallel tooth rows. Ours is very wide in the back, very narrow in the front, um, and fairly short distance between the front and the back. And this is what Australopithecus looks like. It looks very much like this ape. So um, when you look at those features in this, this upper jaw, AL666-1, you can see that it's very wide in the back uh, and wider in the front. It's got divergent tooth rows. It's got a high arched uh, to its palate. If you move your tongue around in your mouth, you have a very domed mouth. And uh, that it belongs clearly in the genus Homo. But that's all we found. We didn't find any more of the face or any other specimens of that time. So we placed it in the genus Homo without a species uh, name. But what was most important about it was that we found carefully fashioned stone flakes that look like the Olduin culture from Olduvai Gorge. This is a flake that was purposely struck by a hammer stone uh, to break off this flake and to create a sharp edge that could be used in cutting. And that cutting was probably associated with processing animal tissue of some kind. So this was a, a, a major leap for us. It took the genus Homo back about uh, something like 400,000 years uh, over what we knew before. And it sits here on the Homo line. But you've still got a gap between 2.4 and 3. And this is where persistent strategic fieldwork comes in. Uh, there was also a skull found in 1997 known as uh, Australopithecus gari that's about two and a half. And it's got a very projecting face. So maybe Alpharensis also gave rise to that. But after this, it dies out. We don't find any more remains of it. Um, 
So persistence pays off. In 1972, when Maurice and I and a few others were running around the AFAR, mapping fossil sites and kept notes on these, Kay Reed, uh, who I mentioned before, looked at our field diaries and so on, and got interested in a site known as Lady Gararu. So if you look here, this is where Lucy was found. This is where our first homo was found. And this about something like 30 miles away or so uh, at Lady Gararu, uh, our Ethiopian graduate student, Chalacho Sium, you know, now there are a number of Ethiopian scholars. Uh, working in the field. There's a, there's a rest in Ayalem Seged, who's now a professor at the University of Chicago. He did a postdoc with us. The new director, as I will tell you, of the Institute of Human Origins is an Ethiopian, which I'm so proud of. And his name is Johannes Haile Selassie. And we'll talk about him shortly. But Chalachu found this mandible, half of a lower jaw, uh, on Kay's expedition. Uh, and it was dated at uh, 2.8 million. So what's it look like? Well, this is the inside, the tongue side. This is the cheek side. This is the occlusal surface, the chewing surface. And this is the uh, underside, the inferior part of the mandible. Uh, it's called uh, Lady Gararu 350-1. And this particular bulbous nature of the anterior part of this mandible, as you can see, is, is, is very much like uh, other forms, other specimens, not this one, but other specimens of uh, Australopithecus afarensis. But what is unique is that the distance between the teeth and the bottom of the mandible is consistent from the front to the back, which is, which is a homo character. And it exposes the third molar back here. This molar would be hidden in a, uh, as you can see here, you see M2, you don't see M3 in afarensis. So, and it has the, the bulging of the mandible here and the, and the mental foramen faces backwards as opposed to upward and forward. It doesn't have this little basin like you have in Australopithecus. So this also is placed in the genus Homo. So now we have two data points here. We have the one geologically closest in terms of time with afarensis that has that intriguing amalgam of afarensis like in the front and homo in the back. Just like we saw in Aethiopicus, which um, has uh, in the front of the face, the projecting face, Australopithecus like anatomy and derived features uh, associated with these vegetarian forms. Um, where do I go here? So in this dazzling uh, depiction, um, we, have, we have added a ancestor for Lucy, uh, for Australopithecus afarensis. And we, this, there were teeth and jaws known from Kenya and uh, from Ethiopia, but it didn't tell us a great deal we needed a skull, and this skull was found in 1995, a beautifully complete cranium of Australopithecus anamensis, which we think on a character to character comparison was uh, potentially the ancestor to Afarensis. Uh, so this is where my model stands today. Um, I, I, wrote up your potential lineages. Uh, most of these fossils we find are, are scattered and disparate. And it's, it's hard to tie them together like this, that I never thought we would get a record that would allow us to propose with some integrity here, I think, uh, actual evolving fossil lineages. Um, so here, this is what it looked like in 1970 when I first got into the field of paleoanthropology my first summer, June 1970, I arrived in Nairobi. And we had Neanderthals, sapiens, Heidelbergensis, or whatever you want to call that creature, Homo erectus in Asia, 
uh, Homo habilis. We had Australopithecus, we had the two robust, Robustus and Boisei, Robustus in South Africa, uh, Boisei in Eastern Africa, and Africanus in Southern Africa. But today, look what's happened. We have close to 25 species. You have your Luzonensis. I don't know if that's Luzonensis, I guess is the right way to. Denisovans uh, have Homo naledi. And these new specimens, uh, new species that have been recognized, whatever this is called, if it's Homo denison, I mean, uh, Altiensis, or what it's going to be called, um, Homo ergaster is added, Homo antecessor is added, um, that we now have really increased the numbers of species. And uh, it's up to us to try to figure out how all these uh, fit together. But the other thing that I was going to say is that the other thing that has emerged that I think is uh, we need to pay attention to is that Afarens, uh, uh, Africanus, Robustus, and Boisei and Aethicopicus are only found, no, Africanus and Boisei and Aethiopicus are only found in East Africa. They're never found in South Africa. And Africanus and Robustus are only found in South Africa. And uh, Sediba is only known in South Africa. Naledi is only known in South Africa. And I don't think that's because of sampling error. I think that there was enough separation geographically between Eastern and Southern Africa over a very prolonged period of time that when there was under very different selective pressures and different sort of arenas of evolution that uh, there were creatures, species that evolved totally separately. And the southern part of Africa, if you look at Africa, is sort of a cul-de-sac. And I think that hominids that moved down there were isolated down there for long periods of time and underwent their own individual and separate evolutionary um, world, separate from what was going on in East Africa. So uh, here is uh, Johannes Haile Selassie, who is uh, now uh, in his first year as director of the Institute of Human Origins. And uh, we are opening a major new set of research labs over 30,000 square feet uh, in a new research building on the ASU campus. Uh, people have moved in mostly, and we will be opening officially on April 19th. And uh, we have some 20 different scientists working there. And uh, we will be testing various hypotheses as to how these things are all related. As we know, if you pick up any paper or textbook, every paleoanthropologist has their own version of what the human family tree looks like. Um, that's why I showed you this sort of simplified version down here. I didn't mention things like Australopithecus ramidus and uh, Ardipithecus ramidus and Ardipithecus cadaver. Uh, these are species that uh, are still being debated as to where they fit on the family tree. Uh, was ramidus an ancestor to Anamensis and Afarensis, or was it an ancestor to Anam Anamensis and Anamensis into Afarensis? Uh, we don't know yet, but uh, I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, an overview of this. So Ethiopia has been an enormous contributor to our understanding of, uh, of paleoanthropology. Uh, beginning way back in the 1930s when the French first explored the Omo, and then uh, in the 60s, late 60s, and throughout the 70s in the Omo region in the south, and uh, and then beginning to in the uh, Afar region with the discovery of that knee joint. So in Ethiopia, you have Ardipithecus, perhaps two species. Um, you have uh, Anamensis. Uh, you uh, have probably another kind of Australopithecus, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, you've got Afarensis, of course. Uh, you've got Gari. You've got Boisei. Uh, you've got an erectus-like or ergaster-like thing from Dhaka. Uh, you've got very early Homo sapiens at 160,000 years. You've got sapiens at two, it's now 233,000 years. 
and something like Homo rhodesiensis or Heidelbergensis, however, whatever you want to call it. I think it's a pro more appropriate to call it rhodesiensis. So we have an incredible six million years of time represented in Ethiopia with uh, a diversity of, of species. And uh, when I was speaking earlier, getting ready for this, I was speaking with Mylene, uh, where are these fossils? Well, these fossils are all stored very safely in these uh, safes in the National Museum of Ethiopia, where trained Ethiopian curators uh, look after them and who welcome researchers from around the world to come and uh, conduct their own studies on this uh, remarkable record of, of human origins. And I will just end with uh, the fact that Lucy has had a tremendous, a tremendous influence on so many aspects of how we look at the world or how we look at our solar system. Um, I was about five years ago, I was contacted by a senior researcher at the Southwest Research Institute in Colorado, who was you know, who had gotten a huge grant, you know, like a billion dollars, that's a lot of money, to develop a mission to the Trojan asteroids, which are, uh, here's Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, which you see prominently in the night sky when it's up, that follow Jupiter around and precede Jupiter around the sun. And they're called Trojan asteroids uh, after the Trojan Wars. And they're probably the least altered of all of the asteroids. There is an asteroid belt, as you know, uh, between Mars and uh, Jupiter. But these are very particular um, asteroids. And they have hypothesized that they are the least modified after uh, the creation of our solar system. And they feel that as Lucy, shed light on the origins of humans, they named this mission, the Lucy mission, uh, a mission that will explore these asteroids and maybe tell us more about the origins of our solar system. So as we speak right now, four and a half months ago, I was at a launch in Cape Canaveral to see this rocket go up with the Lucy logo on the side of it. And it is traveling somewhere out there in dark space it's actually coming back around the Earth because it's it, uh, because it's it's going to go by the sun again and and slingshot out again, uh, and the first asteroid that it will encounter will be in April of 2025, which uh, an asteroid that was in the main belt that was actually named after me, and I will be in the control room with the guy who's flying this spacecraft at the very moment that they do the flyby of that asteroid. And uh, they've invited me back and I, 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 I can't wait for that moment to arrive. So, you know, while Afarensis is maybe not the oldest or the most ape-like hominid species, Ramidus, for example, has big divergent great toads. Um, it's the principal record of transitions of major structural function systems like the chewing system, the locomotor system, uh, and the brain uh, in hominid evolution, hominid evolution. Uh, and it is probably, you know, I'm, I'm ready to be proven wrong. You know, that's what happens in science. We, we, we can never really prove something, but we can disprove ideas with new evidence. But uh, is, is for in my thinking at the moment, as I think you understand, as a last common ancestor to the human genus Homo, meaning Latin for man, and uh, for later Australopithecus species in Eastern Africa, like Aethiopicus and Boisei, that ultimately went extinct a little over a million years ago. Um, there is still an enormous amount to be discovered uh, in Ethiopia, uh, in other places in Africa. Uh, there, will, there are teams that will be back in the field, I hope, within the next year or so, uh, and bringing much more information to understanding this uh, question that unites all of us, where did we come from as, as a species? So I'll just leave you with that, and thank you so much for attending. Uh, thank you so much, Don.
and, and thank you for this most exciting talk. Uh, I, I could listen for hours uh, to this uh, and, and uh, I'm sure uh, everyone else feels like that. It was for me just a wonderful continuation and, and adding so much more details to, to actually my first encounter with you on the TV screen, uh, which was a documentary series in, in search of human origins oh, yes. uh, that you narrated. And I, I remember the scene when, when you talk about the knee and, and how important it was, this find. And, and when you celebrated Lucy and, and playing the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And this, this was uh, such a treat. Um, oh, by the way, do you still have that Fossil Hunter license plate? No. Ah, <laughs> that was an another uh, very fascinating uh, detail I, I saw. I should, yeah, I should see if it's available anymore. I, when I moved out of California, I gave it up. And uh, since I, I've uh, come back here, I haven't even thought about getting it, but maybe I should. Uh, this was so cool. <laughs> I did see, someone did see a Toyota forerunner four wheel drive with the license plate Havilis. Oh. <laughs> That's interesting. Awesome. And, and you already uh, answered my, one of my, my questions, which is, uh, yeah, about uh, the rendezvous of, of the, the, the spacecraft Lucy with, with the, the asteroid named after you in, in April in, in 2025. So yeah, it, it must have been, it must be really amazing to, to be there in the control room and, and yeah, I mean, and to admit it, the, the launch was extraordinary. You know, it was mm -hmm. at five thirty-four, I think, in the morning, and uh, the I was out with all of the main principal uh, scientists on a balcony, you know, looking into the distance and seeing this this launch and feeling the ground vibrate and hearing the roar of the 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 engines and you know as they did the countdown: five, four, three, two. At when they said one, everybody shouted, go Lucy. So it was, a, it was just, a, I mean, I, I, I thought I was in a dream. That Imagine. must have been such a fascinating experience. Don, thank you so much for us. This is such an awesome experience to be with you, uh, to hear it straight from you, uh, the story of Lucy and human evolution from none other than Don Johansson. Thank, well, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you know what I have with me? Um, here is a cast of AL288. <laughs> and Lucy's pelvis. Oh I, actually have, I actually have her whole skeleton done with me. <laughs> Where did you get that? Okay, when you were supposed to come in 2019, then 2020, I ordered the skeleton from the Totovel uh, Casting Laboratories in France. Oh, really? I didn't it was know my excuse to travel to Paris in September 2019 to pick it up. And uh -huh. I'm here waiting for you, the whole skeleton. Well, wonderful. Well, we'll have to, you know, I, I didn't know they were producing it, but it was interesting oh. because in 74, in November, um, uh, I flew th after the expedition was over and spending time in the labs uh, in Addis Ababa, uh, I received permission to take her to my lab in the United States for five years. Uh, but I stopped in Paris on the way through because uh, Copans and, Ty and Tayeb had not seen the specimen. Oh, Tayeb had, but Copans had. So I had her in a, a carry-on suitcase in foam. And when I was leaving uh, at uh, Charles de Gaulle, uh, they stopped me because uh, th it looked like a gun handle with the pelvis. And uh, my French is, is probably not as good as yours, Mylene, but at any rate, um, I told them that this, uh, you know, I said, sit in uh, Fossil de Ethiopia. And one of these guards who looked at me and he said, c'est pas vrai, c'est Lucie? Because what? it was on the front page of Le Monde paper. And all the people who were supposed to be guarding these entrances came over as I unwrapped to show them the real fossil. And it was, it was just a strange moment that I, I realized, how does he know? And he had obviously read the paper. He was interested in it. He said, c'est pas vrai, c'est Lucie, dans la, dans la valise. 
And um, then, as, as you said in your kind introduction, she's become known by everyone. Uh, you know, if, if a new fossil is discovered somewhere and you read about it in the paper, it's always younger than Lucy or older than Lucy or a different species from Lucy or an ancestor of Lucy or, you know, a descendant of Lucy. And uh, one of my goals as a, um, as a scientist and educator is that I have spent a great deal of my life uh, trying to bring this science to people in a way that, uh, that they get, that they understand and that they get excited about. Uh, and um, even with people who, you know, we think of, uh, you know, creationists who think that the world is only a few thousand years old and flat earth people and so on. And even people who, who have very strange ideas still have some kind of an affinity to this specimen. Uh, and, and it turned out that the name Lucy, uh, the Italians love it because Lucia means light, you know, and that this sheds light on humans and how people will use different philosophies and approaches to somehow at least let it in to their belief systems. And it, it, it's, not a, it's not a threat to them because it's, a, it's an affectionate name. It's a female. I think that's important. And that um, in my public presentations and private conversations, you know, I, I try not to challenge anybody it, with regards to their belief systems because that, that's what they believe. But... Um, and it, 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 it's been a fascinating almost uh, 50 years for me. What a great story, Don. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Uh, at this point, we'd like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Michael Tan, who is a physical anthropologist and also the former chancellor of the University of the Philippines. Uh, Don, if I may ask, uh, why is it important for us to study human evolution? How, how, what the, of what relevance is this to us today? How does this help us understand ourselves? Well, I think there are a, quite a number of very positive aspects that help us understand ourselves better. One is that we, we are united by our past, that regardless of our belief systems, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our cultures, regardless of the shape of our eyes or whatever, we are all from Africa. We have a common origin. And if we have a common origin, we have this incredible responsibility to look after our common destiny. And that destiny, unless one of these asteroids, I hope it's not mine, <laughs> comes and wipes out life on this planet, that we really are in charge of where we go from here. And we should remember that the, the, the most important thing is our companionship with every human being. And the other thing that's important for me is that we have come out of, we have evolved from a very natural world. In other words, Lucy was, a, was fully integrated into the natural world. She was as nat a natural a part of that world of nature as was the rhinos and elephants and so on. And today, Homo sapiens, supposedly wise man, but I read the same newspapers you do, um, we, we tend to think of ourselves as separate. Uh, and and when I, we find these links, and the, there's not one missing link, but when we find these links to our past and our commonality, we find a link to the natural world. And we realize that if, if someone had this design or if this was simply through natural selection or whatever, that nature was our real, the, what crafted us on this planet. And that we have to, in many ways, uh, as I have said so often, reinvent a reverence for that natural world and protect it. Because, um, 
we will get to a point where we diminish that natural world so completely that we will destroy ourselves. And we need to think very responsibly about our responsibilities as we move forward as a species. And I think when we look back at the fact that that tree of human evolution is a tree. And the one interesting thing about that tree is only one branch survives. And that means that we are evolutionarily very special, but that is only one branch left. There were times in the past where there were four or five species of humans living at the same time, but today there's only one. And if we don't survive, we will never evolve again as homo sapiens. Thank you. That was a very profound uh, message to us. Uh, I hope it helps us uh, understand uh, our impact as uh, the only surviving branch of uh, homos uh, on, on Earth at this point in time. And I hope it does encourage us to be more responsible okay. for each other, for one another. Uh, Alfred, do you have any more questions, Rick, Aido? Uh, yeah, I think there, there are uh, a few questions also in the chat box. But uh, let me also acknowledge the, the presence of uh, Dr. Harry Vidianto, the site director from Sangiran, who, who actually opened our webinar. And maybe he can join us, Harry? I thought I saw him. <laughs> yeah. Harry, you're on mute. Oh, you're muted, Harry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> How nice to see okay. you. Good nice uh, see you. morning in US, yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, extraordinary lectures concerning the role of the uh, Australopithecus afarensis for the human evolution here. I'm very And uh, I have many questions, in fact, <laughs> but uh, maybe I want to ask only three questions for you, Dr. John, John Johnson. Yeah? Yes, uh, I was student of uh, Professor Kopons. Oh, and yes. at the, the time of the discovery, you heard about the Beatles songs, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we call the discovery with Lucy. And according to the evolution lineage, yeah, you put the Australopithecus Africanus from South Africa into the line in the right, yes. But for the human, you put on the left. And you give the link between Australopithecus afarensis with uh, human, with Homo, for example, with AL 666, yeah. yeah. But uh, before the new discovery of the Australopithecus, a recent discovery, they said is that the Australopithecus africanus is uh, the only one species in Australopithecus at that time who makes the stone tools. Yeah, it means that this uh, type of species, the species of Australopithecus can create the stone tools, what we call all the one, for example, that will be continued by the Homo habilis. And then after that, they continue to evolve to the Homo erectus. But now in your, yeah, in your potentials, yeah, human evolutions in Africa, you put in the lines of uh, Australopithecus boisiae, and also Australopithecus uh, robustus, yeah. Not in Homo. This is right. one of my question, yeah. Before, the base is Homo, but not, it is not in Homo lines. And second, secondly, what is the oldest, oldest dates of the artifacts in uh, Africa? The oldest, uh, I think the oldest dates for uh, stone too, this is a, highly debated question. There are, there's a piece of bone from 3.3 million 
almost yeah. 3.4 million at the Kika, which has cut marks, but there are no stone tools. Yeah. So there's a big debate. Was this, uh, are these natural marks or are they true intentional cut marks? We don't know because we have searched and searched in that same layer for stone tools and we don't find it. And then there are from Lomekwe on the west side of Lake Turkana, uh, these very large rocks that were, were used to crush probably bones. Um, and those may be very early development of the use of stones, um, but to find regularly made Olduin-like tools associated with uh, bones that have cut marks uh, the best date we have is is 2.6 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very and, old, and, which is very old. And uh, very that old. doesn't mean it's the first time. It means yeah. that that's the oldest one we have now. And I suspect, uh, as we know, uh, the African apes, uh, particularly chimpanzees in West Africa, would use a rock to break open uh, hard nuts to get the meat inside the nut. And maybe it was one of those genius moments in human evolution when one of these smart proto hominins used a rock and cut, and, and when they smashed it on the, uh, on the nut, they cut their finger and it might've been an aha moment, recognizing that there was a sharp edge that cut that. And maybe they could use that. It might be that simple, and it might have happened many, many, many times, but it was only one or two individuals who really understood what that meant. Okay. But it's nice to see you. I, you know, I enjoyed my visit to, to uh, Indonesia a number of years ago and uh, went to St. Joran, to the museum. Yeah. Uh, yes. hope what years? Back. What's that? What? Oh, I can't remember. What year was I there? Yes. Now you're now you're asking me the tough questions. <laughs> How do now I? Now we have to come up with a new conference to get everyone together again in this part of the world <laughs> once well, we open. Well, that you know, it's uh, it's wonderful to be able to reach out to so many people who are, are, are listening in tonight and uh, watching. Uh, it's night for me. And, uh, you know, I'm just so thrilled to see so many, uh, so many people who, uh, who are interested in this subject that uh, keeps us all so busy. Yes, and we have been waiting for this opportunity to have you, Don. Uh, in fact, right now, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our friend who is here with us today. She actually named her daughter after Lucy. Uh, the archaeologist Kat Manalo is with us. And her daughter, her baby daughter's name is Lucy. Hi, Kat. Is, is her baby daughter with her? There you are. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Kat Manalo? Yeah. And you have a daughter named Lucy? Yeah, she was born during the pandemic, so she's still a baby. Oh, she, yeah, I guess so. Well, congratulations. You must be very happy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. To have a and, daughter. And it's incredibly a big honor for me to actually hear from you in person, Dr. Johansson. Say that again. It's such an honor to hear you in person. Well, virtually. Oh, well, well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. And I'm so happy that we've you know, had this opportunity, uh, the university and Mylene and everybody has worked so hard for these and there are some very good talks and there's still some coming, I think, right? Yes, we do have, uh, for this semester, we have three or four more to go, Alfred, right? Next yeah, week, we have, we have David Lloyd Kipanitze. That's uh, right, yeah, David is, is uh, speaking next week, uh, next who? Tuesday. David, David. Lloyd Kipanitze from Georgia. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Ask him how he got into paleoanthropology. It's an interesting oh, story. Really? <laughs> yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah. after David, it's Friedemann Schrenk. Oh, Friedemann, you're one of my favorite people. Yes. My advice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the, the, this, this semester's webinar will be concluded by, by Gerd Vandenberg. 
uh -huh. who worked in, in Flores, uh, is in the team of, uh, of the, the group that, that works on Liangua and, and Homo Floresiensis and the associated finds. Wonderful. So it's quite, yeah, it's, it's a very fascinating webinar, uh, that series that we have this time. Um... Ron, do you have time for one more question, maybe a couple more questions? Sure, yeah. And then um, it's a little after. Yeah. Well, we've been on since 7.30 to an hour and a half, yeah. huh? Is that right? So, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, is it okay? Yeah, maybe one last question, if that's okay with you. And people are still listening. Wow. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So many more are probably listening on Facebook and YouTube uh, in areas where the internet signal is not very good. Sure. So this is why we we air on those two uh, me media mediums. Rick, do we have questions? A question. There is a question. Uh, yeah, from from Mary. Um, who is asking, uh, will the new Institute of Human Origins at, ah, there's Mary. Hello, Mary. So it's Mary Dr. Rakelis, Mary Rakelis our is senior uh, member of our department. Here. Ah, sorry, uh, Mary. You want me to ask the question? Thank you. I, I was really, as everybody said, awed and, and inspired by your presentation, Doctor. I, what I wanted to ask you was, I want to see some of the evidence. And because I happen to be going to Phoenix later this year, do you have a museum now that, that will show some of this? Because I have to visit it. Thank well, you. Well, you, uh, you must write to me an email and tell me when you're going to be there. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Institute is, is fully staffed. Um, there are some uh, small exhibits. Um, there is not a museum, but we have uh, a teaching lab and the research lab open. And so you, you can be introduced to uh, our huge cast collection of all of these fossils and uh, have a look at the Institute. It would be a pleasure. Oh, that would be delightful. I am not really a, an archaeologist myself, more in the social side, but I've always followed it with great envy that I wish I could have been more in it. So I will at least go to Phoenix and, and contact you. Thank you. So are, where are you, where do you live now in the Philippines? Yes, I'm also with the afternoon with Alfred and Mylene, okay. everybody. Yes, no, uh, just let us know. It's the entry building to campus. It's on the, on the rail line so people can get off right with the, uh, the tram and walk right into the Institute and uh, you're more than welcome. Everybody's welcome. We hope to have lots Thank of visitors. You. So I written now. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that might be our last question for the webinar, Alfred. So yes. can I, I ask? Oh, oh nice. yes. Yeah. Oh, Harry, yes. Harry yes. I was interrupted <laughs> by the sorry, sorry, <laughs> communication. Can, can I ask one thing? Yes. Yeah. I, you know that uh, in Java, for example, we have no at all about the discovery of the oldest uh, hominins like uh, Habilis or even Australopithecus. So far that we have is only Homo erectus. But some of our scientists, for example, Professor Sartono, Yes. said that the uh, discovery of uh, Sangiran 27 and also Sangiran 31 is very small capacity, yeah, cranial, cranial yeah. capacity, and with a very thick cranial bones. Mm -hmm. And also, according to him, in the middle of the skull, it presents sagittal crest. It is, is not right? sagittal killing. So he presumes that uh, this discovery, for example, 27 and 31, is an indicator of the presence of Australopithecus in Indonesia. And the dating of these two uh, fossils 
is about 1.8 million years ago only, not a very, very uh, old as astral because in Africa. Yep. What is your opinion about these two specimens we found in Indonesia? Well, that, uh, he said that statistical crash presence in the... Yeah, star. I haven't seen the specimens. Yeah. It's difficult to say. Are, are they fully published? 27 and 31? Uh, yes, yes. There is uh, some publications, I think. Yeah. So maybe I will give to you the the, yes, the picture of the stars. Yeah. And yeah. And I'll write back. Okay. Yeah. That'd, that'd be yeah. wonderful. Okay. Okay. I will. And 27 also. Yeah. So right. you can think about that, but uh, as as far as uh, so far, Professor Satono still keep uh, to 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 maintain that uh, that is the indications of uh, the presence of uh, astral pitocos in Java, for example. I will I will uh, send the the picture to you later. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mylene, Alfred. Thank you, Harry. Uh, I, I have one last short question, if you don't mind, uh, Don. Um, the, the insti your institute uh, is, is conducting field schools in, in Hadar, uh, right? I, well, I don't know when it will uh, resume after the pandemic, but do, uh, how is it? How do you accept? How, what's the process of uh, accepting students or uh, how, how can students apply who would be interested in joining you? We, we will send out a notice uh, to, uh, well, certainly Mylene will get one and uh, others will come on our list, anybody who wants to get on our uh, uh, list. And we have a very good website, which is iho at asu.edu. And uh, if you look on there, there will be a prominent announcement and then, um, students or faculty or whoever it is who would like to come and experience that field school can uh, write a letter of inquiry uh, and then there will be uh, you know a, a form to fill out and uh, decisions made on uh, the particular interests of that individual and so on so that's uh, and the, the pandemic has held everything up mm -hmm. and there there just isn't a field school uh, in Ethiopia, but we very much want to uh, reinstate uh, the field school at, at Hadar. It's quite an experience. Great, thanks. Yeah, hopefully very soon. Uh, this, this would be an amazing experience for, for any student, for anyone. <laughs> So All thank right. you so much, Don. We have kept you long enough. Thank you so much for your generosity of spirit oh, and time and wisdom. This has been really a uh, fantastic, fantastic experience for us. Thank well, you my, so my, very my, much. My pleasure and my best regards to all of you. And thank you so much for setting this up. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you somewhere, mm. someday, somehow. We will see you in person. It's not summer, not in summer. Yeah. Not in summer. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a nice all evening. All right. Take you care. Too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone, for watching and, and listening this exciting lecture. And remember, next week, it will be David Lord Kipanice, who will talk about early humans out of Africa, that Manisi perspective. So March 15, 2 p.m. Manila time. Thank you, and see you soon again. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Professor Johansson.